Tenekoto tefano o Aotearoa Unitarians. Tenekoto na manuhere. No mai, hire mai. Ki tene hui topa a te atua. Tenekoto tene tato katoa. Welcome to those far and near to our virtual sanctuary. Today we take a journey into limbo, or perhaps it's a sightseeing tour as we have already arrived. Our tour guide this morning is Buddha, who does not take himself too seriously. He's one of those annoying tour guides making silly jokes. Um, but as the 15th century Zen poet, Ikkyu observes in his poem, he can laugh at himself. In a poem called, I Hate Incense, a master's handiwork cannot be measured, but still priests wag their tongues, explaining the way and babbling about Zen. This old monk has never cared for false piety and my nose wrinkles at the dark smell of incense before the Buddha. I choose not to be one of those babbling priests, though it's certainly within my capabilities. Piety has never been my thing, nor am I particularly fond of incense. But I seek to offer you an experience that you can do with as you will as you negotiate these challenging times. If you have a candle or a little chalice, it's time to light it. We light this chalice that the flame will call us to be fully present, to feel our heart, to engage the next moment without agenda. Our opening song you'll be familiar with, so feel free to sing along. Not only does it kind of fit the dream or the uh, theme, uh, but it was all those things that we just started it to get to do again yesterday. So I thought it seemed appropriate. Usually this is a time for a reading, and the reading I found today is, well, it's lovely, and it's by a Palestinian-American poet. Her name is Naomi Shiab Nye, and uh, it's, in her circles, the poem is, is quite famous. It's called Gate A4 like at the airport. But instead of me reading it, because technology is occasionally wonderful, I found a YouTube clip of her reading it. So I thought I would show that instead of listening to my mellifluous, mellifluous uh, tones. So if you can hang on with me. You know, this is a good time in our lives to be carrying a plant as we travel through limbo in order to stay rooted. As we reflect on her poem, I invite you to listen to this meditative song return again. I've entitled today's musing, Welcome to Limbo. Please leave your certainties at the door. 
Buddha told a parable. A man was traveling across the field when he encountered a tiger. He began to run and the tiger chased after him, coming to a precipice. He slipped and was able to catch hold of the root of a wild strawberry bush hanging in the air. The tiger sniffed at him from above. Trembling, the man looked down only to find that another tiger was waiting to eat him. He thought the bush could sustain him for a while until he saw two mice gnawing away the vine. A tiger above, a tiger below, the man saw a ripe strawberry near him. Grabbing the vine with one hand, he plucked the strawberry with the other and ate it. How sweet and delicious. This is how the enlightened one welcomes us to limbo and invites us to enjoy the moment. For as Shunru Ryu Suzuki Roshi put it, life is like stepping into a boat that is about to sail out to sea and sink. Limbo is a place we are called to live without the comfort of certainties other than those of death and taxes. You don't have to be Siddhartha Gautama, AKA the Buddha, or a Unitarian minister to know that we find limbo stressful. As human beings, we share a tendency to scramble for certainty whenever we realize that everything around us is in flux. In difficult times, the stress of trying to find solid ground, something predictable and safe to stand on, seems to intensify. But in truth, the very nature of our existence is forever in flux. This, this isn't exactly headline news. All of us have lived in times of uncertainty, individually or as a family, in a city or in a country, but rarely have we lived in a time of global uncertainty. Perhaps World War II, 9-11, and the global financial crisis in 2008 come close, but the present pandemic is by far the worst of them all. No country has been spared since the first case was recorded. The 5.2 million who have died and the 264 million who have become ill, those are numbers that are hard to wrap our mind around. The economic consequences have been horrific. The psychological toll is counted in broken relationships, domestic violence, and suicides. We have been through Alpha and Delta, and now we're threatened by Omicron, which we know little about. All we know is there are a lot more Greek letters to name future COVID variants until we reach the last letter, Omega. But for the moment, we have come out of lockdown. We can savor a flat white or a pot of tea at our favorite cafe, like the strawberry, sweet and delicious. What exactly is the attraction of certainty anyway? It turns out the brain likes it and finds uncertainty painful. Certainty is the confidence we have in our beliefs, including the sense that something just feels right. John, Jonah Lehrer coined a phrase called information craving. The idea is that we crave information for the sake of it. 
often that information doesn't make us more effective or adaptive. It just reduces a sense of uncertainty. It's part of the reason that mind games like solitaire, sudoku, and crosswords are enjoyable. They give us a little rush from creating more certainty in the world in a safe way. The magazine Scientific American Mind goes so far as to call this an information addiction. It's all about the burst of dopamine we get when a circuit is completed. It feels good. But that does not mean it's good for us all the time. Knowing that we automatically avoid uncertainty explains why any kind of change can be hard. It's inherently uncertain. It explains why we prefer things we know over things that w might be more fun or better for us, but are new and therefore uncertain. It explains why we prefer the certainty of focusing on problems and finding answers in data from the past, rather than risking the uncertainty of new creative solutions is why some religions prefer a theology of certainty. This is why Christians drawn to this view have supported slavery, support homophobia, stand against other faith traditions and cultures, speak against care of the earth, advocate an economics of neoliberal capitalism, and stay closed to any possibility of question and a change in their approach and faith. Well, it's good to have a foundation of faith to stand upon, a theology of certainty that takes such an unbending approach has caused much harm. And tragically, it is a theology that is practiced by many. A characteristic of uncertainty is imper impermanence. It's hard to feel grounded when there might be an earthquake tomorrow. Right. One of the virtues of Buddhism is that it does not shy away from uncertainty or impermanence. This is the fundamental anxiety of being human. Anxiety or queasiness in the face of impermanence isn't something that afflicts just a few of us. It is an all-pervasive state that human beings share. But rather than being disheartened by the ambiguity, the uncertainty of life, what if we accepted it and relaxed into it? What if we said, yes, this is the way it is. This is what it means to be human. Once someone asked a well-known meditation master, in this world where everything changes, where nothing remains the same, where loss and grief are inherent in our very coming into existence, how can there be any happiness? How can we find security when we see that we can't count on anything being the way we want it to be? The teacher, looking compassionately at this fellow, held up a drinking glass and said, you see this goblet? For me, this glass is already broken. I enjoy it, I drink out of it. It holds my water admirably, sometimes even reflecting the sun in beautiful patterns. If I should tap it, it has a lovely ring to it. But when I put this glass on a shelf, and the wind knocks it over, or my elbow brushes it off the table, and it falls to the ground and shatters, I say, yeah, of course. When I understand that this glass is already broken, every moment with it is precious. Every moment is just as it is, and nothing needs to be otherwise. To achieve what the meditation master experienced, we need to overcome our addiction. 
we must stop craving information to keep uncertainty at bay. The Buddha offers a simple spiritual path, but not one easy to live out. Bird Nest Roshi. Roshi is a title of esteem for a master. Bird's Nest Roshi was a teacher who lived in and did meditation in a tree. The governor of his province heard about Bird's, Bird's Nest Roshi and went to see him. He found the master sitting in his tree doing meditation. He called to him saying, oh, Bird's Nest, you look very insecure to me up there. Bird's Nest Roshi looked down at the governor and replied, oh, governor, you look very insecure to me down there. All things under the law of change, all things are under the law of change and political position is the most ephemeral of all. The governor knew very well what Bird Ness Roshi was talking about, so he took a different tack. Tell me, he said, what is it that all the Buddhas taught? Bird's Nest replied, never do evil, always do good, keep your mind pure. Thus, all the Buddhas taught. The governor responded, always do good, never do evil, keep your mind pure. I knew that when I was three years old. Yes, said Bird Nest Roshi. A three-year-old child may know it, but even an 80-year-old politician cannot put it into practice. To begin this practice, Pema Chodron, an American Buddhist nun, shares a dream about her ex-husband. I was just sitting down for a quiet evening at home when he arrived with six unknown guests, and then disappeared, leaving me to take care of them. I was furious. When I woke up, I thought ruefully, so much for being finished with my anger. Then I started thinking about an incident that had occurred the previous day and I began to get furious all over again. This completely stopped me in my tracks. And I realized that waking or sleeping, it's just the same. It isn't the content of our movie that needs our attention. It's the projector. It isn't the current storyline that's the root of our pain. It, it's our propensity to be bothered in the first place. The propensity to feel sorry for ourselves, the propensity to be jealous, the propensity to get angry, our habitual, all too familiar emotional responses are like seeds that we just keep watering and nurturing. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but every time we pause and stay present with the underlying energy, we stop reinforcing these propensities and begin to open ourselves to refreshingly new possibilities. As you respond differently to an old habit, you may start to notice changes. In the past, when you got angry, it might have taken you three days to cool down. But if you keep interrupting the angry thoughts, you may get to the point at which it takes only a day to drop the anger, eventually only hours or even one and a half minutes. You're starting to be liberated from suffering. Then you can begin practicing to live the three vows, do no harm, take care of one another, and embrace the world as it is. Do not begin this practice thinking the vows can be achieved. There will be no dopamine high reward, no test to pass. 
So how will you know you've experienced some level of enlightenment? One indication is you experience chaos as good news. Limbo doesn't scare you. In fact, you begin to see its beauty. You step into groundlessness and find it relaxing. You feel fully present with an open heart to the world as it is, while not longing for a world that isn't. Not there yet? Me neither. Buddhists often refer to these vows as commitments, which suggests this is a process not to be achieved, but lived. I could sign up for that, since resisting the uncertainty and impermanence of inescapable limbo isn't doing it for me. Blessed be. I hope those words inspire some thoughts and reflections on your journey through limbo. Here's a meditation to keep them going by Ma Maureen Killeran. Holy grandparents of the universe, energies of creation, endless mysteries of life. You are the music that sounded before our world was born sound and silence woven throughout the ages, far beyond the most profound wisdom humanity has been able to touch. Be with us, deepen our willingness to live without certainty, to take the risks of living on the edges of our creativity, to step beyond the boundaries of possibility and hope. Help us always to remember that we are in our essence, the magic of star stuff, that we are, we are kin to all that is and was and may yet come to be. Teach us to temper our impatience, to retain our conviction that what we do makes a difference, that even our smallest act to contribute to the good of a greater whole. Be with me in my uncertainties. Rejoice with my small triumphs. Comfort my losses. Remind me I'm never alone, not in my joys or in my tears. In the blessing of our silence, may I feel your presence something greater than I have yet been able to comprehend. I'm going to offer this closing song for our, as a source of hope. My closing words this morning are by Gwen Matthews. Feel that? Every, each breath, every inhale, exhale, we are living, breathing, connected. We are the whole, complete, beautiful selves that we were born to be. Feel that? in your bones, in your muscles, in your heart and your blood. That is the extraordinary you, the you who was born for this time, this place, this moment. Feel that? The struggle, the worry, the pain, the loss, the grief. It is still you. You are still whole, complete, beautiful, extraordinary. Feel that. 
And now it's time to extinguish the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. It's always a challenge for me to come up with something that'll keep Unitarians out of their head when you get together in your breakout groups. I, I want to know what's going on inside you feeling-wise. I want you to sh be vulnerable a little bit and share that. And you are masterful at avoiding my efforts. So I'm trying again. So the conversation this week, how do you respond internally to chaos? And if you want to get into your head, then you can talk about how do you deal with it. 